Our sermon passage this morning comes from Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. I'll be reading the 25th through the 37th verses. Listen now for God's word to us. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But... A Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's gospel lesson takes place towards the end of Jesus' life. We're getting close to the end of Luke's gospel here. Right before our reading, the 70 disciples have been sent out. They've been sent out on a mission to teach, to preach, and to heal, and they've been very successful. So successful, in fact, when, when they come back, they say to Jesus, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. Animosity between Jesus and his disciples and the religious establishment in Jerusalem had been growing. Jesus always seemed to be doing things that got under their skin. For example, having the audacity to forgive sins, and then doing work and healing on the Sabbath. But now with the return of the 70 and the news of the success of their mission spreading, Jesus and his followers have most certainly captured the attention of the synagogue officials. After all, Jesus and his disciples were so much more effective than they had been, and their position in the eyes of the people was starting to be threatened. And so a lawyer, one of Jerusalem's religious elite, challenges Jesus. He was a DRP, a designated religious person. He was one of the few who could read and write in that time and place. People turned to him for advice and direction. And throughout years of study, lawyers known in other places in the Bible as scribes or experts knew God's law, the Torah, inside and out. This DRP, this lawyer, sidesteps all the small talk And in front of a huge crowd goes up to Jesus and says, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Even if it is a test, it is a good question, isn't it? It's a do question, not a be question or a being question. It's a question that many of us might have. What do I need to do to live? Jesus, true to form, answers with a question of his own. What is written in the law? What do you read there? 
Well, Jesus and the lawyer both knew the answer to that question. We know the answer, too. Any bar mitzvah-aged Jewish boy would have known the answer. It's the summary of the Ten Commandments. It's what has been taped together from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. The lawyer answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you shall live. We all know the right answer, don't we? That is, we know that we should love God above all else. We know that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we strive to not only love our neighbor, but if we don't act on what we know, our faith, our faith is only half-baked. Or as James puts it, faith without works is dead. Getting the word, God's word, right is not the same as giving a right answer. Fred Craddock, who never was a groupie of any any artist, but if I was a groupie, I would be a groupie of Fred Craddock. He's my most favorite preacher of all time, no longer living, but he was a great preacher and teacher. And he says having right answers does not mean knowing God. Students can make a four-point in Bible and totally miss the point. Knowing the right answer, knowing what to do is not enough. We must act on what we know. We must do the right answer. Love God with all that you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. You must do love. A right answer never got up with a sick child in the middle of the night. A right answer never wiped a cool washcloth across the forehead of a dying friend. A right answer never wrote a check to Presbyterian disaster assistance. A right answer never volunteered at the free clinic or sent uniforms, supplies, or donations to Lakewood Elementary School or served on a Honduran mission trip. Some of you here today I know have been Protestants all your life, I have, and we know that one of the outcries of the Re Reformation was faith alone, grace alone. We don't believe in works righteousness. We know that there's no way that we can possibly earn our way to heaven. Even so, according to Luke, Jesus said that what we do counts. According to Luke, Jesus does indeed care about how we live and especially about how we relate to those who are in need. After Jesus tells the lawyer to do this and you will live, the lawyer stands up again and says, who is my neighbor? For the second time, Jesus answers his question with a question. He turns up the heat in telling him the parable of the Good Samaritan. Did you notice that the designated religious people, the DRPs in this story, don't come out in the most favorable light? We've got the priest and the Levite who see the man laying in the ditch and hurting. They see him, but they pass on by. They don't even come near. And then the most least likely candidate the most least likely to succeed in the eyes of the Jews of the southern kingdom would have been a Samaritan. They were considered half-breeds, and they had a separate um, place of worship than the Jerusalem temple, uh, Mount Gerizim. This Samaritan, he's the third person to come by, and he sees, and he is the only one who fulfills the law by treating the man as his neighbor. It's the Samaritan, the least likely to succeed, that actually does. Why? Because he lived what he believed. He put his faith into action. Earlier in Luke's gospel, when Jesus was teaching the crowds, we remember how the, they were coming in on him, and his mother was there, and his brothers were there, and they were trying to get in to see him, and he was told that they were there. And perhaps you remember what he said. He said, my mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. The proof is in the pudding. Our discipleship should demonstrate compassion 
in action. There are two verbs associated with the DRP, the priest and the Levite. They both see and then they pass on by. On the other hand, there are 13 verbs associated with the action of the Samaritan who comes near the man, sees him, is moved with pity, went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil and poured wine on them, put him on his animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him, took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and I will repay you whatever more you spend. Doing love cost the Samaritan money, resources, and time. He paid two denarii, in other words, two days' wages to the innkeeper to care for him. And he said, if he has any other bills, put them on my tab. I'll take care of him, them. He also used his own animal to transport the man from the place where he found him to the inn. And he gave up a day and a half of his life, of his time, to care for this man. Of all the verbs associated with the Samaritan, there is one verb that leads to all the rest. And it, it is come near. He came near. And this is what God in Christ has done for us. In the life of Jesus Christ, in the birth he has come near us. He is God with us, Emmanuel, and walks with us and enters into our struggle and into our joy and into our pain and suffering and everything in between. He came near and being filled with compassion, he showed us a way, a way to live and a way that we can live right here and experience eternal life now and in the life to come. When God calls us to come near, God also calls us. Luther says we are little Christs, and so we are supposed to be imitators of Jesus Christ, and we are called to walk in Christ's footsteps and come near as well. And when we come near, the compassion of God blossoms. The Samaritan had compassion for the injured man. Compassion means to suffer with. To suffer with. Make no mistake, there is risk in coming near, in getting close. Look what happened to Christ. The road leading from Jerusalem to Jericho was a dangerous road. About 17 miles long, it descended three, nearly 3,300 feet through rocky desert country, and there were multiple places for thieves and bandits to hide and ambush travelers. And this man comes near. He knows that. He sees it's already happened to one person. It could happen to him, too. Maybe they're lying in wait for the next person that comes along, but still, he took the risk, and he came near. There are many places in St. Petersburg where our neighbors are in need, where there is need for us to come near. Just like any city, there are multiple hospitals and nursing homes where there are folks that ha never have a visitor. Although most of us live in affluent areas, we don't have to drive too far to find people who live in poverty. I'm reminded of our partners with the Lakewood Elementary School just four miles down the road and how many of them are homeless and living in poverty. When we take time to come near, it can be overwhelming. I can understand the lawyer's question when he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? We may want to know, too, how far does my responsibility extend to the people in my neighborhood or my zip code or maybe those in my church or those who think and believe and act just like me or for those of us who are working to those in the workplace? Just how far do I have to take this love in action thing, Jesus? But once again, Jesus doesn't answer this time he rephrases the question. After telling the parable, he asks, who of the three proved to be the neighbor? You see, God's love, the love we are supposed to emulate, draws no boundaries and demands no repayment. 
it's a big, big job, and none of us are going to do it perfectly, but especially on a day like today, World Communion Sunday, we remember that we are not alone in this task, and with God's help, we can make a difference when we do love. On this World Communion Sunday, we remember that we belong to the body of Christ that stretches around the globe, and in a little while, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper and as we celebrate it, we also look forward to the Messianic banquet, the time to come when God's peaceable kingdom will be a reality on earth. When the beautiful passage from Isaiah that paints the picture of the wolf lying down with the lamb, the leopard lying down with the kid, and when they shall never hurt and destroy again on my holy mountain becomes a reality. John of Patmos speaks of it, telling us that people from every nation, from every tribe, speaking every tongue will be gathered by Christ who will shelter and guide us and lead us to living springs of water that will give life and will wipe away every tear that is in every eye. Christ has invited each of us to help build and create that peaceable kingdom. When all was said and done, Jesus never did answer the lawyer's original question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Perhaps Jesus is letting us answer that question for ourselves. After all, when God's word is incarnate within us, it takes a different shape and a different form because God has created us each uniquely with different talents and gifts, and only we can make the offering of love to God and love to neighbor that we, nobody else can do that for us. Or perhaps there's another reason. Perhaps Jesus didn't give the answer because once we start doing love, the question, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life, doesn't quite seem so burning anymore. Because when God's word becomes flesh in us, heaven is where we are. Amen.